Hey everyone, I hope you've had a great week. Today we will discuss how the human reproductive system works in both men and women, how reproduction occurs and how contraceptives work. Let's start by having a look at the male reproductive system first. At a first glance, you will be able to tell that the reproductive system is interlinked with the urinary system. You have the ureter which transports the urine from the kidneys into the bladder, and then from the bladder, the urethra transports the urine through the penis so that you can urinate. Right below the bladder, there is a gland called the prostate gland. You might have heard about it before. This gland produces fluids which are then included in the ejaculate. At the bottom, you have the testicles which are enclosed by the scrotum. The testicles need to be at a lower temperature than your body, which is at around 36 degrees Celsius. However, if the testicles were kept at that temperature, the sperm would die. So to avoid this, the testicles drop. The testicles are where the hormone testosterone is produced, and it is also where sperm is produced. In the testes, there are several tubes, called the seminiferous tubules. These are where the sperm cells are produced, through that meiosis process we talked about in a previous video. The seminal vesicles are where most of the fluid that makes up the ejaculate is produced. These vesicles are connected to the testes by the vas deferens, which is just a tube that carries that fluid from the seminal vesicles to the testicles. So basically, you've got the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland producing fluids, which are part of the ejaculate. These fluids then travel to the testicles, where they are mixed with the sperm cells produced in the seminiferous tubules. After all the components are mixed together, they go to the epididymis, which sits on top of the testes, and this is where the sperm is stored, and also where the final stages of sperm maturation occur. So the sperm become usable only after passing through the epididymis, otherwise they are unable to fertilize an egg. I mentioned the meiosis process, which is responsible for producing the sperm cells. This process is called spermatogenesis, so genesis, or formation, of the sperm. This follows those steps of the meiosis that we discussed previously, but let's look at another diagram of the whole thing. So you start with a cell called the spermatogonium, which is the initial cell present in the testicles. This cell has the normal 46 chromosomes that every other cell does, and it has three choices. It can remain as it is, so nothing happens to it. It can choose to form clones of itself, so it goes through the mitosis process. Or the final alternative is to reproduce, so it can form the gametes, i.e. the sperm. When it decides to do the latter, this spermatogonium goes through mitosis first, which turns it into the primary spermatocyte because it's the first stage of the process. The primary spermatocyte then goes through meiosis 1 and forms two secondary spermatocytes, so the homologous chromosomes are separated, which means that each of those two spermatocytes has 23 chromosomes instead now. They then go through meiosis 2, giving rise to four spermatids. In this stage, the sister chromatids separate. All these steps would have happened in the seminiferous tubules. Afterwards, the spermatids are moved to the epididymis, where they undergo their final maturation and turn into sperm, where they are given a tail and a head so that they can start swimming. Now let's have a look at the female reproductive system. So you've got the uterus, which is the organ where the fertilized egg attaches to, so it is where the baby develops. On each side of the body, you have an ovary. This is where the eggs are formed. From the ovaries, you have the fallopian tubes. 
So the eggs formed in the ovaries travel through the fallopian tubes, and this is where fertilization occurs. So the sperm travel up the tubes and meet the egg halfway. Then, the fertilized egg travels to the uterus and stays there. The bottom part of the uterus is called the cervix, and then the vagina links it all to the outside. Similarly to spermatogenesis, the process of producing the oocytes is called oogenesis, and it occurs in the ovaries. So here's a diagram of this process. It is similar to spermatogenesis in the initial stages. So the initial cell is called the oogonium, which goes through mitosis first, so the name then changes to primary oocyte. This oocyte then goes through meiosis 1 and forms two cells, a secondary oocyte and a polar body. This happens because the two daughter cells are divided unevenly during cytokinesis, forming one normal sized oocyte and the small polar body which ends up disintegrating and will never be fertilized. Then the second meiosis occurs on that secondary oocyte, so then an ootid is formed as well as another polar body which ends up disintegrating as well. That ootid then matures and becomes an ovum. However, this second meiosis only occurs if there is fertilization. So basically, the secondary oocyte is released once a month into the fallopian tubes, in what is called the ovulation. If a sperm travels up to the tubes and penetrates the oocyte, then the oocyte goes through meiosis too, giving rise to an ovum and the polar body. This fertilized ovum then travels to the uterus and implants there. If that secondary oocyte is not fertilized, then it is still released during ovulation, and after around 24 hours, it disintegrates. It is important to know that these two processes, spermatogenesis and oogenesis, only occur after puberty. In men, spermatogenesis occurs throughout their whole lives until old age, so they can have kids until they die. In women, the oogenesis process only occurs until a certain age, because women are born with a predetermined number of oocytes, so then when they run out, we enter what is called the menopause. But hey, quality over quantity. In order to prevent reproduction, there are several options for both men and women. The most common contraceptive are the condoms. These simply prevent the sperm from entering the vagina, and some condoms also have spermicide, which is like a pesticide for sperm. It kills the sperm. Condoms also protect from sexually transmitted diseases. Then you have the contraceptive pill. There are several methods of action for the pill, but in general, they prevent ovulation so the oocyte is never released, meaning there can never be fertilization. The pill also thickens the mucus of the cervix, making it harder for the sperm to swim in it. Another form of contraception is the IUD, which stands for intrauterine device. This is a little plastic and copper device that is inserted in the uterine wall. The copper in the device is slowly released into the uterus, which prevents the egg from implanting in the uterus, and it also thickens the cervical mucus. Finally, there's the morning after pill. This is an emergency alternative when other methods have failed, or if no contraception was used during sex. It primarily works by preventing or delaying ovulation. We've reached the end of today's video. Please visit our Patreon if you want access to exclusive content, if you want to take your revising skills to the next level. I hope to see you again next week. Bye now!